My name is Dave Feibusch, and I'm going to run through the serial digital seminar that we did at NAB, teach a little bit about the serial signal and some of the test and measurement methods we have in mind for it. This chart shows the quantizing levels for NTSC. It has several columns of information on here. On the left, we have the analog values for various things such as sync tip and blanking in millivolts, IRE units. Then we have the 8-bit values and the 10-bit values. And notice for each of the digital values, we have the levels in decimal, the values in hex, and the values in binary. So you get the relationship between all of the values. Now first I'd like to show you something that has to do with the excluded values. Notice at the top the values 3FF through 3FC are excluded and at the bottom the values 3 through 0 are excluded. Those are used for synchronization purposes which we will discuss later. Notice that for the special values of sync tip, blanking, and peak white that the conversion from 8-bit to 10-bit just involves having two extra zeros on the end for 10-bit. So there is no value change when you convert from one to the other. And finally, I'd like to show that the peak 100% chroma still has some headroom below the largest excluded value of about 50 millivolts. So that gives you plenty of headroom for the large 100% bars. This chart shows the connections for the parallel digital cable. Note that it's 25 pin connector on each end and that there are 11 twisted pairs, 10 for the data and one for the clock. Here we have an example of the parallel cable. Note that the 25 pin connector is rather large. If you had 100 of these on the back of a routing switcher, obviously it's going to take up a lot of space. Another thing regarding the parallel cable is that it's only good for about 50 meters. And after you go through distances longer than that, the clock to data timing can come off, be off and you will not be able to receive the signal. So those are a couple of the reasons of why we want to go to serial. And of course here we have the serial cable and it's just your regular coax and BNC. The point being that this cable is already installed in many facilities and you can use the cable that's there. What we want to do is look at some of the ways that we will evaluate the present systems and see if they're going to do the job for you. This chart is a simplified block diagram of parallel to serial conversion. What we have is the parallel data coming into a shift register. The 14.3 megahertz clock is multiplied by 10, giving 143 megahertz clock frequency. And then the data is shifted out, least significant bit first. Then it goes through an encoder and a scrambler, which give you an output of scrambled NRZI as per the proposed standard. The reason we need NRZI has to do with the transmission channel and recovering the clock, which we will show in the next slide. The serial signal before scrambling and encoding is NRZ, which stands for non-return to zero. This is a signal which is similar to what you would see on a circuit card. That is, when there's a zero, you have a low, and when there's a one, you have a high. NRZI stands for NRZ inverted. And what happens in converting to NRZI is that now we have the information in the transitions. That is, whenever there's a transition, that means a 1. And when there's no transition, that means 0. Then here is another transition for a 1, transition for a 1, transition for a 1, and then no transition for a 0. The advantage of NRZI is the fact that you can invert the signal and you still have the same information since it's contained in the zero crossings. Now some things to note are that if you had all ones, you would basically have a square wave at one half of the clock frequency. And if you had all zeros, you'd basically have no information at all because it would be just constant. Now the 
problem with all zeros is that we must extract the clock from the data. And in order to extract the clock, we need to have zero crossings. So even though all zeros are excluded values, you could still get into the situation with a flat field where you had mostly zeros. So by putting the signal through a scrambler, which is a mathematical function, and then going through the inverse function on the receiver, what we do is we ensure that there are enough zero crossings or transitions in the signal to easily extract the clock in the receiver. This chart shows what the serial signal would look like on an oscilloscope. First thing I'd like to point out is that what we have in the center here is an eye, and this is called the eye pattern in digital communications. And it's important because at the center of the eye is where we're going to want to determine whether we have a high or a low to extract the data. Now the signal seems to be going three different directions, and in fact it might go any one of them. It might have been at a low and then make a transition to a high at a clock point. It might have been at a high and make a transition to a low. Or it might be at either a high or a low and then just keep going because there was no transition, namely if there was a zero. The signal itself has certain specifications, some of which are part of the serial standard and some of which are others that we use. Specifically, the standard will tell you that the amplitude is to be 0.8 volts, plus or minus 10 percent, that the rise time is to be about one nanosecond, that is from 0.75 to 1.5 nanoseconds, and that's measured from the 20 percent point to the 80 percent point, since this is an echo signal. And also it says that the jitter is to be plus or minus 250 picoseconds. This is averaged over 64 microseconds, and we'll talk about what that means a little bit later. Some specifications which are not in the standard are the overshoot, which in our generators we try to keep below plus or minus 10 percent, and then the period between clock cycles, and this is basically due to the television signal, and its accuracy comes from the original plus or minus 10 hertz on the 358. This is the 1730D waveform monitor, which is one of the instruments we can use to look at the serial signal. This is a general purpose television monitor in that it has an analog input, a parallel digital input, and two serial loop throughs. What we're looking at here is the serial signal on one of the loop throughs, which has been displayed using an equivalent time sampling method which gives us about a 500 megahertz bandwidth. The calibration is that in the vertical direction, 10 IRE is 100 millivolts, and in the horizontal direction, one major division is two nanoseconds. So using this waveform monitor, we can look at the serial signal and see if it is meeting the standard specification. This is the same signal seen on an analog scope, and of course here the trace is very continuous looking as opposed to the dots that you saw on the sampling scope. But basically we see pretty much the same picture. This is a one gigahertz bandwidth scope, which is in fact the bandwidth you need to accurately measure the rise time of this signal. This is a digitizing oscilloscope, which again has the sort of dot pattern like we saw in the 1730D. And we're triggering on the rising edge and using the measure mode to tell us that the peak amplitude is around 850 millivolts, the rise time is around one nanosecond, and the overshoot is around two or three percent. Returning to the 1730D, we can then with this general purpose television monitor see the same type of signal as we saw with the oscilloscopes, which then gives you an opportunity to look at the serial signal and do it with equipment that you will also use for other monitoring purposes. Now let's talk about jitter measurements. A basic jitter measurement could be made using the serial signal on the vertical deflection of a scope and then having a reference clock for the horizontal trigger. And what that would do is that would give you the total amount of jitter in the signal.
Now, in fact, that's not the way that it's normally done, and it's not the way the signal is received. What normally happens, remember, we're going to extract the clock from the signal, and we do that in a phase lock loop, which is basically a pulse shaper going into a bandpass filter to bring up that second harmonic content of the square wave, and then a zero crossing detector, and then finally we use that to trigger the scope or to recover the data. It's the time constant of this phase lock loop that gets back to the 64 microseconds in the specification. Because the number of zero crossings and the time of the zero crossings varies with the data, you need to have a time constant in your phase lock loop which will eliminate any clock variations that may be due to the data, hence the 64 microseconds. This is the method that's used in the 1730D. So when you look at the 1730D uh, display, you're seeing jitter measured in much this manner. This slide shows how you might measure the jitter if all you had was an oscilloscope to trigger on the signal itself. And what we've done here is we've shown triggering on the rising edge of the signal and then going down some period of time that might be due to just horizontal expansion or some sort of a delayed sweep and then looking at the zero crossing to measure the jitter. Now this is a method which you have to take a little bit of caution with. The reason is that if you have jitter at some submultiple of the clock frequency, for instance, one-tenth of the clock frequency, and we have that in the serial digital situation because remember that we multiplied the clock by 10. In this situation, if you go out a, an amount that's exactly equal to the period of the jitter, in fact, what may happen is the jitter will disappear. And so therefore, you have to be careful, and the graph at the bottom essentially shows you that if you had a sine wave of jitter, that if you go out multiples of the jitter frequency, you will get a null and you will see no jitter. On the other hand, if you go out halfway out of the, the jitter period, then you can get something which is actually twice as big as the jitter. So although this gives you some useful information, you have to be very careful about how you interpret it. We can show you this on the waveform monitors and the oscilloscope so that you can understand what's going on. Here we see the serial signal on an analog scope. We've triggered on the rising edge here, and then as we move out on expanded sweep, we can see the zero crossings, and you'll notice that they are considerably fuzzier than the original. And when we move out, eventually we will get out here to the tenth one and you notice that the tenth one is quite a bit sharper than the ninth or some of the others. And this is the phenomenon of where the jitter will look a lot less if you happen to be at a multiple of the jitter frequency. So the ninth one is rather wide and the tenth one is rather narrow. So it gives you some idea of the jitter, but you have to be careful how you interpret the information. Here we see the same signal on a digitizing scope and we are looking at the ninth and tenth zero crossings and in the measure mode we're measuring jitter and on the ninth zero crossing we're measuring jitter of 260 picoseconds peak to peak and on the tenth zero crossing we're measuring 100 picoseconds peak to peak so again we see the difference between the tenth one which is a multiple of the clock frequency and the ninth one where the jitter has not been canceled out by that effect. Here we are using the windowing feature and the extended features of the digitizing scope. And what we have is we have a zero crossing that is 64 microseconds away from the original trigger point. And we have a histogram of the data that's being gathered at that zero crossing. And what it's telling us is that the peak-to-peak -peak jitter is 436 picoseconds and the RMS jitter is 95 picoseconds. So here we're actually going out the full 64 microseconds to get the jitter data. Now again looking at the 1730D,
we have expanded the vertical by times five and we're looking at the zero crossing and here of course we're using the clock extraction method which is getting the clock out of the signal and considering the major division is two nanoseconds we are seeing about four or five hundred picoseconds peak to peak jitter shown on the 1730D. So again we can use the 1730 to make similar measurements and in this case the preferred measurement to that which we had done on the oscilloscopes. We've looked at several time domain aspects of the serial signal. Now let's look at a frequency domain aspect. What we have here is a chart showing the spectrum of the serial signal and note that there is a null at 143 megahertz and at its harmonics. Remember that we said if we have all ones then we have a square wave at one half of 143 megahertz. And if we had a perfect square wave, it would have no second harmonic. Hence, there would be a null at 143. In fact, what happens is that the rise and the fall are slightly non-symmetrical, and you will get a small spike at 143 megahertz. Remembering back to the clock extraction scheme, what happens there is you change the square wave to a series of pulses, which gives it a lot of second harmonic, and you bring up that component at 143 megahertz in order to get the, the clock out of the data. This chart shows the cable losses for a spec value of 8281 coax. The solid line on here represents 100 meters of 8281, showing 7.5 dB of loss at 71.5 megahertz. If we had two, three, four hundred meters of cable, we can look over here and we can see, for instance, that 400 meters of cable would have 30 dB of loss at 71 and a half megahertz. The way that the serial standard is specified is it says it's for use in coax cable with losses up to 30 dB at one half the clock frequency. So that's what we're depicting here. The other thing that's on this chart, which is this dotted line, which represents what would happen if you had some sort of a mismatch in your long cable. And then what would happen is you would not get a nice smooth roll off, but you would get bumps. And we'll be demonstrating this later with some bad cable. Now once you've gone through this long length of cable, what you're going to find is the signal is greatly attenuated and it must be equalized in order to bring it back to its original form and extract the data from the signal. This chart shows what the characteristics of an equalizer for 400 meters of cable would have to be. Remember that we have 30 dB of loss at 71 and a half megahertz that we must make up. And in order to get the rest of the data, we're going to need 44 dB of gain at 143 megahertz. Now what's happening is because of the loss, the input signal is fairly small, 30 millivolts type of amplitude. And we're going to bring it up to an 800 millivolt output. So what you can see is you've got a wideband amplifier with a lot of gain at high frequencies and it's the design of these equalizers which are going to determine how long a run you can actually make with the serial signal. What I'd like to do now is show you what happens when we go through various lengths of cable. We have a patch panel with five meters of cable patched in and many more lengths available to patch in. The signal then goes through the loop through on the 1730D and is terminated in 75 ohms at the 2710 spectrum analyzer. And notice that the spectrum is like it was in the chart with the nulls and the lobes and even the little spikes at the multiples of the clock rate. Now what I'm going to do is patch in 100 meters of cable. And with 100 meters of cable, we still see an eye pattern of sorts on the 1730. 
And on the spectrum analyzer, we see that the signal has been attenuated. The first lobe is still strong, and the second lobe is there. Now let me go out to 200 meters of cable. And at 200 meters of cable, we're not seeing too much at all on the 1730. And in the spectrum analyzer, again, we're losing more and more of the high frequencies. Now at this point, it would be good to look at the television picture. And what we have is we have a linear ramp. And as you will see on the television picture, the, the picture looks just fine. There are no problems at 200 meters. Let's go out now to 300 meters. And at this point, there's really nothing on the 1730 that's of any interest. And as you can see on the spectrum analyzer, we now basically have energy only at 143 megahertz and below. The point that we want to make here is that it's the 143 megahertz and below where you have to take care of what you're doing with the signal. Now, how does this all work? Because if we go back to the television picture at 300 meters of cable, everything still looks great. And of course, that's the equalizer. So one of the things that we can do with the 1730D, which is very handy, is that we can actually look at the equalizer output. So by changing to the equalizer output, we once again see an eye pattern. And this is why the system is working. Because the equalizer has taken that very small signal and it has made it back into a signal from which we can extract the data. What we would like to show now is what happens with a short but bad cable. And here we have your not very typical bad cable. Nonetheless, the signal is coming through. If we look at the 1730D at the eye pattern on the input, we see that the eye pattern has still got a nice opening in it. And in fact, the picture on the monitor looks quite good. Next, what we're going to do is to add a terminated stub onto the bad cable. And now the eye pattern has gotten quite a bit smaller due to the double termination. But it's still open. And if you look at the monitor, you will see some errors, but the picture is still pretty much there. Finally, we're going to take the termination off of the stub, and everything goes away. The eye pattern is gone, and the picture is nothing but noise. And what's happened is we've essentially put a short at the half the clock rate, and we can tell that by looking at the spectrum analyzer, where we see there's a notch right in the middle of the data. So therefore, it's not unexpected that the picture would be bad. Having looked at the analog properties of the serial digital signal itself, now let's look again at some of the digital properties. This chart shows the samples that are used in the horizontal interval of the composite digital signals. Basically, these samples produce a nominal horizontal interval with sync and burst. Here we see the 0F0, that is the blanking level, the 010, which is the sync tip, and then blanking and burst and so on. Now in the parallel interface, this is all that there is, namely just a sampled version of the analog signal. When we convert from parallel to serial, there is some data that we must add, and then there's some other data that we are allowed to add. What we must add is what's called the TRS and ID. TRS stands for Timing Reference Signal. The reason that we add the timing reference signal is so that when we get the serial stream of data and we're going to make it into parallel, we know where the words are going to start. Because in the serial stream, there is no identification except for this added TRS and ID.
This is added in the sink tip, or it replaces samples that would otherwise be in the sink tip. Following the TRS and ID, there's room for what's called ancillary data, which could, for instance, be four channels of AES-EBU audio. They follow the TRS and ID, and they are in the sync tip. This chart gives you the definition of the TRS and ID data words that are placed in the sync tip. What we see is that the first word in the TRS is all ones. That was one of the excluded values, and now we're using it as a synchronizing information. That's followed by three words that are all zeros. Again, the excluded values. So that makes the timing reference signal and allows us to do the word framing on the deserializer. Next, we have the ID. And the ID provides us with two information, two types of information the field number and the line number. For the field number, we have three bits, which gives us fields one through four and one extra bit for our PAL friends because they have eight fields in the color sequence. And then the lines are numbered one through 31. What we've done here is because on the serializer we need to, to figure out the line numbers, we add that information in and then on the deserializer, the information is available in case someone wants to add some bits or do something uh, else in the vertical interval, and they don't want to have to go back and look at equalizing pulses and broad pulses and all that. So we number the lines 1 through 31 using these five bits. The bit 8, which is the next to the most significant bit, is called a parity bit. And what that means is if you have an even number of bits in 7 through 0, then bit 8 is a 0, so that all of the bits 8 through 0 will be an even number. Or if there are an odd number of 1s in 7 through 0, then you make bit 8 a 1. So again, you will have an even number of 1s in bits 8 through 0. And then finally, we make bit 9 be the opposite of bit 8, or not bit 8. And what that does is that ensures that regardless of the other numbers, we will not have either all zeros or all ones. So that excludes those values by that particular method. Now we would like to show you on the logic analyzer the parallel digital signal. On the screen here, what we have is a cursor that is going to run back and forth along the bits that are available. And down here, we have a number which shows what the value is the cursor sees. So we're starting out here at peak white, which is the, the white part of the linear ramp. We will go down from white to blanking, which is 0F0. Then we will come to the leading edge of sync. And we will go down to sync tip, which is 010. We'll come to the trailing edge of sync. And we will come back up to blanking of 0F0. And now we go into this area, which kind of looks like a burst, and indeed it is. And then we will go on down to where the ramp begins. And because the ramp is a linear increase in count, what we see here looks just like a counter. Now, going back to the sync area, what we can do is we have a special modification to this generator so that it will actually put the TRS and ID out on the parallel port and we can look at it. So here we are at peak white again, 320. Go down to blanking, 0F0. Leading edge of sync, go down to the leading edge of sync. And now we have one to three samples of 0, 1, 0, and then the next sample is 3FF, which is in fact the excluded value for the beginning of TRS. Then we have 1, 2, 3, all zeros, and then finally we have the ID signal, which in this case is looks like 1F8. Then over in the other part of the sync tip, Again, at the moment, all 0, 1, zeros. 
is the area where ancillary data would go, but we don't happen to have any ancillary data on this signal. This chart shows the ancillary data format. The way the format works is you start off with an ancillary data flag, which is similar to the TRS, but uses different values, followed by a data ID. So this will tell you what type of ancillary data you have. So far, the only one that's actually been defined is AES EBU audio, but there will be others. Then there is a data block number, and this is a counter that cycles through, which will help you find out if there's been some sort of a switch or something going on while the data is being transferred. For instance, if it was audio and this block number went 13, 14, 50, 22, 23, 24, then you would know that there was a problem or that there had been perhaps a vertical interval switch. Following that, there's a data count which tells you how long the data is going to be. And notice that the maximum data is 255 words. Now, 255 words won't actually fit into the horizontal sync tip. So you have to say how long your data is. And then in areas where you might have more than one ancillary data packet, you'd know where one packet ended and the next one began. And then at the end of the data packet is a checksum, which is used to determine if this has been received correctly. Now that we have additional data to put into the serial signal, we're going to need a method to do that. And this is a block diagram that starts off with the basic serializer that we had originally and adds to it a coprocessor. The purpose of the coprocessor is to add the TRS and ID and then add any other ancillary data that there might be to the incoming composite signal. Now that we have all of this digital information placed in the serial stream, we'd like to look at what happens if there are errors. This calculation shows that in one field of video, there are about 2.4 million bits. If we change that to a bit error rate of one error per field, we find 4.2 times 10 to the minus seventh bit error rate would give us one error per field. This is similar to what you might get on a very well tuned up VTR without any correction at all. But in fact, it's unacceptable because you would see one error per field. What we expect with the serial transmission scheme is essentially no errors over long periods of time. So here we've shown what the error rates would be. For instance, 8.1 times 10 to the minus 14th would be one error per day. And in a properly working system, you might not even get that one error per day. At Tektronix, we've developed what we call the EDH concept, error detection and handling, that will determine if there are errors in the transmission while program material is being transmitted. This concept has been proposed to SIMPTI, and we expect that it will become a recommended practice. The way this works is you take the data from the coprocessor and for a complete field, you do a calculation called a CRC, which stands for cyclic redundancy code, which gives you a unique value for that field of data. And you put that value in the serial stream. And then on the deserializer, you do the same calculation on that field of data. You compare it to the CRC that was sent with the data. And now you can find out whether or not you have an error. If you have an error, you can report it, say, to an external computer. Also, you can raise a flag which will send that information on through the digital stream to the next location. Now, by doing this, we've been able to automate the determination of whether or not the system is failing. And we can show you this with some various cable lengths and our 1730D monitor. What we're looking at here is the 1730D monitor. And we have 375 meters of cable in. And the picture looks good. 
down in this lower right hand corner you see the light that says detect that tells you that the monitor is detecting that an EDH package is being sent below it there is a light that's named alarm and that will go on if it gets an error now 375 meters we're very very occasionally getting an error you just saw one there that light has a one second time constant in it now I'm going to add 10 meters of cable and what you see is that the light is on continuously meaning we're getting at least one error or a second or more and if we look at the picture monitor we're seeing occasional errors in there but the picture is still pretty much there so now I'm going to go to 400 meters of cable and what will happen is that the light is on all the time and the picture is bad so basically what we've shown here is that this method will tell you when you get to the end of your run and it will automatically tell you if your signal has gone bad so it can be used for detecting errors without somebody watching the screen. This concludes the run through of the digital seminar that we gave at NAB. Please use this tape for internal training purposes and along with the overheads it will give you the information that you need to present the seminar. Thank you very much.